So 1 Corinthians 15 is actually a really long chapter. We just read the entire thing. And this is commonly referred to as the resurrection chapter. You know, this whole thing is, is essentially dealing with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, we're, there's, there's plenty of, of doctrine to learn. Um, I'm not going to be able to do justice to everything. So let's jump right in here and get started because I want to spend a little bit of time just on the first two verses because it is a cause for confusion among a lot of believers. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And Again, he starts off just by saying, you know what? I declare unto you the gospel. And it's funny, out of all the doctrines in the Bible, the one that gets up more, more so than any other doctrine is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, what it takes to be saved. It is, it is the most tampered with. It is, the, it is the one doctrine that the most people get wrong is this doctrine of what the gospel is and what it takes to be saved. Now, people will oftentimes turn to this passage that want to teach a works-based salvation. So they'll, they'll point to verse 2, right? By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And they'll say, see, look, it's, it, you know, some people can believe, but they're believing in vain because they don't have the works in order to, to maintain their salvation. And that's the argument that they use. But what's stupid about that is that these are always the types of verses that they'll turn to you know, to prove that you need works. And does this proof say that you need to have works to be saved? Not at all. Now, there are a host, mountains of scriptures that say, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And all throughout Scripture, it's, it's the same requirement. Believe on the Lord. Believe on the Lord. Believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. That is what's required for salvation is that Faith, for by faith, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. All throughout the Bible, you have a mountain of evidence saying that salvation is by grace through faith. That is only believing that saves you. And then you get someone, oh, well, what about this verse that says, yo, know, you could believe in vain? Well, I'll tell you about this verse, because it's actually really not that difficult to understand. And this scripture is actually much easier to understand for those of you that actually go out and go soul winning. In fact, we even encountered this today. And, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. So we were out soul winning today, preaching the gospel, and um, we're talking to this girl uh, Brother Sebastian was actually, he was giving her the, the gospel and really making it clear and going through a lot of examples and she was listening and listening and listening. And what Brother Sebastian was doing was sowing the word of God in her heart. He was sowing that gospel seed in her heart. That's the work that he was doing. Now, she did not get saved while we were talking to her at the door as far as we can tell. She did not put her face, she decided, you know what, no. I need to think about this. I need to wait. And she decided not to, to believe on Christ with all of her heart according to her words. Look at what the Bible says. In Matthew 13, we have the story here of the parable of the sower. And Jesus explains this parable of the sower. Matthew 13. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It should be well known. And if you don't know it that well, go ahead and read it. After, the, after church tonight, go home and read the entire parable, Matthew 13. But in verse 18, he explains the parable unto his disciples. Because he says, you know, some fall on stony ground, some fall on good ground. So, you know, and, he, and, he, and he's talking about like planting seeds, sowing seeds. And he explains in verse 18, he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Verse 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom... And understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So he says, look, 
There are people that you preach the gospel to. You're sowing the seed of the word of God in their heart, but they don't understand it. They don't get saved. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't take root. It doesn't, they don't receive it. Because in all the other examples, they receive the word that's sown in your heart. And that's all you need to do to be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Once you receive that seed, you are born again. That new life has sprung up inside of you. But when people don't receive it, when they hear the word, it's sown in their heart, and they don't believe it, well, guess what? That seed is not going to last there forever. The Bible teaches that the wicked one, Satan is going to come and catch away what was sown in their heart. And he wants to make it so that they don't believe, so that they don't get saved. And I was trying to explain this to the, to the uh, young lady that we were speaking to this afternoon. Of, of, she's saying, well, I kind of want to wait. And I, and I stepped up. I said, well, wait, I don't think you do want to wait. And I explained it to her like this. Think about this. I said, when we showed up at your door, were you thinking about Jesus? Were you thinking about death? Were you thinking about heaven? Were you thinking about any of these things? She, she kind of laughed and she was like, no. And I said, you're thinking about these things really hard right now because we're talking to you about it. We brought it up. You, you're having this conversation with us right now. But what's going to happen is we're going to leave. And you know what? Maybe you'll think about this a little bit more tonight. Maybe you'll think about it tomorrow. But you know what? It's going to fade and you're going to forget all about it and you're not going to think about this again. And then what's going to happen? You don't know what a day is going to bring. And it's important that we stress this with people at the door too, that you don't know how long you have. You don't just have unlimited time and you don't want to forget about these things. Just get it settled in your heart. And I was trying to plead with her to get saved. She wouldn't. She, she decided not to. And you know, everyone has that free will. But... Um, this is this flip back if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So what he's talking about here is believing in vain. There are people that claim that they believe in Christ all the time. We run into them. But does that mean that they're saved? Now we know that salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but I'll, let me explain what I mean by that. People will say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But when you ask them what they have to do to be saved, they'll tell you things like, well, you believe in Jesus, you go to church, you pray, you know, and they start listing off all of these other works. So people that believe a gospel that is believing in Jesus plus doing all these extra works and all these other things, they're believing in vain. Or here's another very good example. Let's say, let's say that person that we talked to today heard everything, and instead of saying, no, I want to wait, she said, yeah, you know what? I want to get saved today, and she prayed a prayer, right? And then we see her a month later, and we talk to her and say, hey, you know, and just start questioning her a little bit about salvation. So do you know for sure, you, you know, if you die today, you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, what do you mean you hope so? Well, what do you, you know, what do you think it has to take? Well, you know, I'm trying to do what's right and, and I'm still having some problems with sin. And, you know, obviously they didn't get it. They didn't understand the gospel if that's what they're still believing, that's what they're still thinking, you know, a month later after they prayed a prayer. See, praying a prayer isn't what gets you saved. It's believing in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and just receiving that gift of salvation is what gets you saved. So if someone, you know, even... Praise the prayer and they listen to the whole thing. If they don't actually believe, they didn't get saved. Now, we can't see the heart. We can only take what people say with their mouth, with their words, and just hope that they did understand everything and they did get it, which is why we spend so much time trying to make it as easy to understand as possible so that it's unlikely that someone won't get it. But if someone does that and they, and they, and they claim to believe, if they don't if they don't keep it in memory, like if they, don't, if they don't understand it later, just like what salvation even is, what the gospel even is at all, then they believed in vain. If they're, if they're just thinking it's something else. They didn't quite understand it. And see, when you don't understand something, you're not going to remember it. I, you could think back to, I know I could think back to, to my education, to my school to whatever it is, grammar school, college, whatever level of, of education I was in, there are certain concepts, there are certain things, especially in, in science and in math, 
and uh, for me at least, when you'd be studying and trying to figure something out, it's real confusing, right? You, you approach maybe a math problem or algebra, you know, some people have a problem with algebra, and it's like, you know, what is this letter? I don't know, you know, 2x, what does that mean? And it's really confusing, because up to the point before you learn algebra, you're dealing with numbers. You're doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, and it's kind of like, okay, I could get that because it's easy to understand. And then you start adding in these, these things, and it's like, what in the world? It could be real confusing. Until you, the light bulb comes on, right, and you, and you get it. You might get an answer or two right here or there, but if you go back and try to do that again later, you're not going to know how to do it. And in a, in, in a way, that's, that's a similar to how you could believe in vain. When you don't understand something, you'll get But as soon as you get it, it's like, oh man, you work through something and you finally, the light bulb comes out, you're like, man, I get that now. You get that to the point where it doesn't matter how many problems you have to do now after that because you get it, it clicks, it's understandable. It's not going to, that, that understanding is not going to depart from you. It, it, it's saved in your memory because you've, you finally have comprehended and understand it. And it's the same way with the gospel. Because the gospel is, is extremely simple. It's very basic. It's very rudimentary. It's not complicated at all. It's not even as complicated as algebra, right? It's like addition. That's how simple it is. So it's not difficult to understand, but you need to comprehend it. And if you don't comprehend the gospel, then you can't believe the gospel. And this is a, the, the point I try to emphasize with so many other people that um, you know, oftentimes Christians will think, especially new believers will just think that tons of people are saved because it is so easy. Oh yeah, all you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ. But just because someone says they believe in Christ doesn't mean they actually are only trusting in Christ for their salvation. And as simple as it is, there's still a lot of people that can claim Christ that are not actually saved and that they didn't, um, that they do, that they are believing in vain. So this verse really isn't, it's not teaching that you have to do works. It's just saying that, look, if you don't even understand the gospel, and that's why he started off saying, I declare unto you the gospel. And what he's doing here, he's actually causing a lot of doubt on the salvation of many people at the church at Corinth because later on we're going to see how he's saying, you know, some of you are saying that there is no resurrection from the dead. And he goes in to tell them that your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. Because the gospel which he declares unto us is verse, starts in verse number 3 here. For I delivered unto you First of all, that which I also received, that I also received the gospel, and I gave it unto you, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel. That is the good news, is that Jesus Christ died to pay for our sins. He was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead. That's the gospel. And what's going on here, and we'll get in, as we get into this more and more, these people are saying, well, there's no resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, you're not saved, period. And he's saying, this is what I delivered unto you. This is what I preached unto you. So how can you be saying that there is no resurrection? You must have believed in vain. Because that which was delivered unto you, you didn't keep in memory what I preached unto you. Because you didn't understand it. Because you were thinking something else is, is necessary for salvation. If, if the resurrection is, is an integral part of salvation, we have to believe that Jesus Christ conquered death and hell and he rose again from the dead. And he fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies. That's why he says here, notice that he says multiple times, according to the scriptures, right? It says, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He fulfilled scripture. He fulfilled the prophecy that was laid out in the Old Testament about the Savior that was to come, which is why we can even have the faith and believe on him, because it was already prophesied in the, in the past, and he has fulfilled all of the, the, the prophecy of the Savior to come. And this is, by the way, when you're explaining 
Because oftentimes, you know, we, and, and we do this here, and, and it's, I don't think it's a flaw, but we have to be careful of this. When we go out soul winning, one of the big things that we stress probably more than anything is eternal security and the concept, of, because it is integral also to the, to the concept of salvation, how Christ paid for every single sin. It's not you paying for it. He has already done it and paid for it on the cross, how it's eternal life. And those are extremely important concepts to go over. And I'm not saying not to go into depth in those. We absolutely do need to. But one of the, the benefits we have in our current time and location and everything else is that many people have already heard about Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And that's, almost, that's like pretty close to being common knowledge among people in America today. Is that people have heard that and they understand that and they know that. But we need to make positive that we are not negligent to bring that up because that is the guy. I mean, if you're preaching the gospel to somebody in your zeal to, 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 to get them saved and, and show them everything, do not skip over the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again from the dead because that's the guy that was delivered unto Paul. And that's what Paul delivered unto them. Now, you don't have to spend tons of time on this if they already know it which is why we don't invest a whole bunch of time in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because most people accept that and just they understand that. But the, the part that they're having a problem with is understanding eternal life. They have an understanding that it's still not based of works and they, you know, in these other air problem areas. But there are still people out there, and that's why I don't want you to just get, get um, lazy over this. I've run into kids especially that don't know anything about Christ. That people just, the only, the only thing they hear about Jesus Christ is when their mom or their dad just yells Jesus or something and like that's the only exposure they have to Jesus. And they know nothing about Him. So, you need to, when you have your conversation with people, you're not just preaching at them, you're asking them questions as you're preaching the gospel to them. You need to find out what they know about Christ and, and about, especially about the death, burial, and resurrection. And this is the perfect chapter to turn to, 1 Corinthians 15, in order to explain the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ because it's all laid out right here as the gospel. So if this isn't part of your repertoire of verses that you turn to when you're giving the gospel to someone, I would highlight these verses and mark them down. 1 Corinthians 15 very plainly goes through and explains how Jesus Christ... Um, died for our sins according to scriptures he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and then he goes on to explain verse 5 and that he was seen of cephas then of the 12 after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep and now he's explaining how there are plenty of witnesses to the fact that Christ rose again from the dead. It's not just one person saying he rose again from the dead. It's not just two people saying he rose again from the dead. It says here, he, <coughs> he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. People have seen this. This was not just some secret that Christ rose again from the dead. He was seen by hundreds of people after his resurrection that he truly did bodily rise again from the dead. And he even says here, you know, of whom the greater part. So most of the people that had seen Jesus are still alive up until the time when he was writing this, this epistle to the Corinthians. So he's saying these people are still alive even today. He's like, some of them have fallen asleep. Some of them have, have passed away, right? Some of them have died. But the majority of them are still around today. Go ask them, right? And they had the benefit here in the Corinth. Like, go ask these guys. They saw Jesus, that he rose again from the dead. Verse 7, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Now, a lot of people claim, oh, I've seen Jesus. Oh, I just dreamed, I saw Jesus. Oh, I had this experience and I was in my room and I saw Jesus Christ. It's not true. They may think they've seen something. They may think they've seen Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean they saw Jesus Christ. The Bible says right here that last of all, he was seen of the Apostle Paul. And you know what? No one's going to see him again until he comes back again 
in the clouds at the rapture to, to get us out. No, no eye on earth is going to see him. So anyone that claims they've seen Jesus, you know, first of all, I like to just ask them, well, what did he look like? Oh, he wore a white robe and he had real long hair. It wasn't Jesus. As we covered already in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Jesus does not have long hair. I don't care what some sodomite painted a picture of on the wall that supposedly is supposed to be Jesus with long hair. That is not Jesus. But he says here, last of all, you have seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, why do you say as of one born out of due time? Because when the apostle Paul saw him, it was after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And that's when he, because the apostle Paul was out persecuting the church and he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus Christ literally appeared to him in the way. And um, he was the last apostle. He was the least of the apostles. Um, which what he says here in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He said, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. He says, I'm the last of the apostles, I'm the least of the apostles, and I'm not even worthy of that title. Because who are the other apostles? All of the other apostles were those that were with Jesus Christ like throughout his ministry, that they actually learned from him directly, and they also witnessed his resurrection from the dead. And when they repl replaced the office of Judas, they did it. They chose from people who had been part of Jesus' ministry earlier on and that could be witnesses of his resurrection later. That is what an apostle was, was chosen from. And that's why he was, Paul was the last apostle. And, you know, there's these apostolic churches and people who claim to be apostles. There aren't any more apostles today. Paul was the last one. We don't believe in, in, in multiple apostles and that, and that you know, pastors are apostles. No. The apostles lived during the time of Jesus Christ and they witnessed physically his resurrection. And the reason why Paul is saying, he's like, I, I shouldn't even be called apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He said, I was against them until his conversion. Whereas all the rest of the apostles were working with Jesus, not against him. Um, but verse number 10 reads, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And he's saying, by the grace of God I am what I am. He's saying, you know, I shouldn't even be called an apostle. I did so much damage against the church. He says, but the grace that God bestowed, because God gave him grace, he gave him mercy, he says, even though he has done all these things and all these sins, you know, Apostle Paul in another section says that, that, um, that he's chief among sinners, whereas among whom I am chief, talking about his being a, 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 a sinner, because he persecuted the church of God. He says that the grace that God gave him in his salvation, the grace that God showed upon him and having mercy upon him, that he could still be saved even after all of that because he did it ignorantly in unbelief when he persecuted the church. He thought he was serving God. He thought he was doing the right thing. He didn't just have a rejection of God. When he finally got saved and all that mercy was bestowed on him, he says, God didn't bestow that on me in vain. He didn't do it for nothing. And you know what? There are people today where it can be said that they get saved. Yes, praise the Lord. They have mercy shown on them. But ultimately, the way that they live their life is kind of in vain because they didn't end up doing anything for God anyways. They didn't end up serving Him. They didn't end up going and telling other people how to get saved. They didn't do anything with that great gift that was given unto them. So in a way, they got saved in vain. Now, obviously, it's not completely in vain because they don't go to hell. But what he's saying here, and he's, and he's likening this to the works, he's saying, hey, the grace that was bestowed upon me, that wasn't in vain. He says, but I labored more abundantly than they all. He says, I worked harder than all the other apostles. He says, I, I labored more abundantly than all of them. And the Apostle Paul, he did. He worked harder, as, as what we can see is evident in the Scripture. I mean, he went and traveled around all over the place and, and preached the gospel. He worked day and night, laboring with his hands. He suffered the most persecution and, and probably did the most 
probably more than just about any other person who's ever lived. The Apostle Paul is a great example of a Christian. And he's saying, you know what, it wasn't in vain. And you need to make sure that the salvation that God has given to you, the grace that he's given to you, that it's not just in vain. Hey, why don't you do something with your life? Why don't you serve the Lord and, and show God, hey God, I'm going to do something with what you've given me. I'm going to bring the gospel to other people and I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can to bring honor and glory unto your name. And notice, it's, it, even when he says, he says I've, I've labored more abundantly than all, he says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He doesn't take the credit for himself. He doesn't just lift himself. He has to be very careful. He's not just lift, And we all need to be careful that we're not just lifting up ourselves and, and getting caught up, even if you are doing a lot of work for the Lord, to get so prideful of saying, look at all that I've done. And say, well, no, God made this possible. The grace of God that was with me is the reason why I was able to do all of this labor and this work because God was with me. God gave me the strength. God gave me the abilities. God gave me everything that I needed. The grace of God that was with me. Verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, talking about the other apostles, so we preach and so ye believed. The gospel must be preached in order for people to believe. Romans 10, if you want to turn there, Romans 10, a very famous chapter, verse 13 reads, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen and amen. Salvation's easy. Call upon the Lord and get saved. But then it explains in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You need to believe in order to call on Christ to save you. You have to have that faith in your heart. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? It's impossible to believe something you haven't heard about. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what hasn't been taught you. You don't know what someone hasn't told you. And how shall they hear without a preacher? How is it going to happen? It's not going to happen. That's the answer. You say, oh, but I read in the Bible. No, look, if someone isn't preaching to you the word of God, and explaining it to you, you're going to be like the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip came up to him and he was reading about the Lamb. He was reading his Bible, was reading Isaiah, and he didn't understand it. And Philip asked him, he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how, how can I except some man should guide me? When you are not saved, you don't understand the Bible. You're not going to understand the Bible. You need somebody to preach the gospel unto you. You need someone to preach God's word unto you to give you the understanding so that you can receive Christ, so that you can believe, and then the blinders come off. And then the foreskin of your heart is removed. Then you will have the spirit to discern this spiritual book. Not prior to that. God is the one who designed things the way that he did. And he says, look, you need to preach the gospel. So it's not just not being able to read the Bible. You know, reading the Bible isn't going to save people, but now there is reading a tract. Someone needs to preach the gospel. If all you ever do is handing out tracts to people and not opening your mouth boldly and preaching the gospel of Christ, you are not getting people saved. But I handed out 10,000 tracts. You're not getting people saved. How shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Does it take a preacher to hand out a piece of paper? I've got somebody that comes to my house that delivers pieces of paper every single day. He's called the mailman. And guess what? He's not a preacher. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know, maybe he's a preacher somewhere else. But, <laughs> but you don't have to be a preacher to be a mailman. You don't have to be a preacher to hand out a piece of paper, to stand on a corner. You do have to be a preacher in order for people to hear the gospel, in order for them to hear and believe and call on the name of the Lord and get saved. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Get it? You need to be in a good church or else you're not going to be getting sent to preach the gospel. 
But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hearing by the word of God. That's why the Apostle Paul said, go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. They believed because of the preaching of the apostles. That's why they believed. Because they were preaching the word of God. They preached the gospel that was delivered unto them. They delivered unto others. And that's why people even got saved and believed. That's what the scripture teaches. Verse number 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, because that is what they were preaching, right? He just said that earlier. I delivered unto you what was delivered unto me, how that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that the third day he rose again from the dead. He's saying, now look, if Christ was preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? This is what we preach to you, and this is what you claim to have believed. But now you're saying there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If there is no resurrection, then Christ surely didn't rise from the dead. If you're going to sit there and say, no, the dead don't rise, then that includes Christ. And if Christ be not risen, then, look at this, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. He brings it right back up to verse number two when he's talking about believing in vain and ties it in with them not believing in the resurrection. There was a part of the gospel that they didn't believe. You could say, yeah, but I believe Christ died for our sins. Yeah, I believe that he was buried. But if you don't believe that he rose again from the dead, you're not saved because you don't believe the gospel. Look at verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. He's saying, look, if the dead don't rise, then we are liars. Then all of us apostles that are going around and preaching that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, if the dead don't rise, he's saying, then we're just a bunch of liars. We're false witnesses if the dead don't rise. And the disciples all proclaimed that Jesus Christ literally, physically rose from the dead. They saw him. They ate with him. They spoke with him. And that's what they were witnessing and going around and telling everybody, hey, Christ is alive. They were all sad and felt defeated when Christ died on the cross. But hey, the joy and the resurrection... When they saw that Christ has risen from the dead, he's conquered death and hell. Hey, nobody can hold him down. Nobody can conquer Christ. I don't care what authority there is or power on this earth. No, nothing can bound Christ. And that is the, the, the glory in the resurrection of Christ and gives us that hope of our own resurrection from the dead. No, the apostles were not false witnesses. The disciples were not false witnesses. But we do have some false witnesses today that call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. But they're really Jehovah's false witnesses. You say, why do you say that? Because they don't believe in the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you talk to them about it, they're going to be real sneaky about how they answer you. Just like all the cults do. Because they don't like being exposed for what they are. But if you go and look at their literature, and if you go and actually get an in-depth conversation with them and try to pin them down, they do not believe that the same body that Jesus died with, that he rose again with. I've got a quote here. It says here, uh, the Watchtower organization says that Jesus did not rise from the dead in the same body he died in. And this comes from their, their uh, literature, You Can Live Forever on Paradise Earth. Pages 143 through 144 explains that that's what they believe. They believe that he rose as a spirit creature. Now, Turn, if you would, to John chapter 2. This is important to understand. This is important, especially if you're going to be having conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses. 
and you want them to get saved and you want them to believe the gospel and you want them to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. If you want them to get saved, they need to believe that Jesus Christ bodily, physically rose again from the grave and that he wasn't a false witness of himself when he said in John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The words of Jesus Christ, John 2, 19. And then the next two verses explain what he was talking about. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple of building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. The scripture says that Jesus Christ was referring to his body. And that's why he said, destroy this temple, his physical body, and in three days, he's going to rise it up again. If Jesus came in a different body, then he's a liar then he is a false witness. But I don't believe that Christ is the false witness. I believe that the Jehovah's false witnesses are the false witnesses. And that they don't understand the gospel because they didn't receive the gospel because they're believing in vain. They are yet in their sins. Amen. And they call him a spiritual creature. Well, in Luke 24, verse 39, after the resurrection of Christ, Jesus said this, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. He says, touch me. Feel my body and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. He wasn't just a spirit. It wasn't just a spiritual resurrection because he told them to touch him. They said, look, you can feel me. I have flesh and bones. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, but Jesus Christ did when he rose again from the dead. He even went to Thomas and said, because Thomas said, unless I put my hands in, in the holes in his hands, unless I feel the, you know, where they pierce him inside, he says, I'm not going to believe it. And Jesus appeared unto Thomas, and you know what he said? He said, come here, Thomas. Here, give me your hand. Look, feel the holes in my hands. And he took his hand and thrust it in his side. And he says, be thou, uh, you know, believe and be not um, unbelieving. That's at the end of chapter John. I, wanna, I don't want to misquote that. He says, reach hither my, thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. That's what Jesus Christ said to Thomas. But the old witnesses will say, well, it was a different body, but he made it look like it was his, his, you know, he had these holes and stuff just so that they understood that it was Jesus. No. It was his body. Yeah. They, they come up with this nonsense because they have a man-made doctrine that they just want to promote because they're false witnesses. They don't want to believe that Christ actually rose from the dead and actually gets saved, but they're damning other people to hell with their damnable doctrines and their heresies, and they just come up with something because they have to try to make some sense of the Scripture somehow, but in their unregenerate mind, they don't know how to do that, so they come up with bizarre doctrines. For if the dead rise not, we're back in 1 Corinthians 15, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. If Christ didn't, if that resurrection didn't happen, he says, your faith is vain and ye are yet in your sins. Now, I don't even have this in my notes, but as a side note, there's a lot of people that believe, and I'm not going to go too in depth in this, but when Jesus Christ was on the cross, right before he gave up the ghost, he said, it is finished. And some people teach that everything that was required for our salvation was done when he said, it is finished. And that is simply not true. It's a lie. And this verse right here can prove that because he didn't rise again from the dead yet. And if Christ be not raised 
then your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. The resurrection had to happen in order for a people to be able to get saved. The whole thing had to happen. The death, the burial, and the resurrection are all required for our salvation. Not just, not just the death on the cross. It's the resurrection. So no. Now, it doesn't mean that it is finished has no meaning, but I'm not going to get into all that, but it doesn't mean that everything required for salvation was done. And see, the reason why people say that is because they don't want to believe that Jesus Christ went to a literal physical hell. They think he went to some paradise, some nice place that's in hell. When, again, that's a whole other topic for a whole other sermon, when the Bible teaches plainly that in Acts chapter 2 that his soul was not left in hell. Oh, you didn't leave me in paradise. No. When you're not left somewhere, it's, that would be a bad thing. You know, Thanks for not leaving me there. His soul was not left there. Neither did his flesh see corruption. He wasn't left in hell. He rose again from the dead. But like I said, that's a sermon for another a topic for another day. But we see here that if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and ye are yet in your sins. So you're not even saved if, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, if you don't believe that. And that's why the Jehovah's false witnesses are yet in their sins. Well, let's keep reading here. Verse number 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. saying, look, if Christ didn't rise again, then all the other saints, all the other believers that died, they're just perished. They're just gone. They're dead. If the dead don't rise from the dead. He says in verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. See, if there's no resurrection from the dead, if this is it, if this is what we got is right here on this earth, he's saying, then of everybody in the whole world, we are the most miserable if this is all we got. Why? Because when you proclaim Jesus, and you live for God and live for Christ, you suffer persecution. They were being beaten. They were being spit upon. They were being arrested and thrown in jail. They are of all men most miserable. If this is all we have to look forward to, it's just in this life. If that's all we got, then I'm going to be like, hey, I'm going to make as much money as I can and, you know, and live it up and, and eat, drink, and be merry. Right? For tomorrow we die. That's the attitude of the unsaved world. That's the attitude of people that think, well, this is all we got. When I die, I'm just going to rot in a grave. And if that is all we got, then we're the most miserable of all of them. But we know that that's not all there is. We know that there is, there is a resurrection. And we know that Christ rose again from the dead and he proved that there is a resurrection for us also. Verse number 20 but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So just like we have a physical body, we are descendants of Adam ultimately, since he was the first man created on the earth, we are all descended from him and we have the natural body from Adam. Well, we're all going to die. I mean, these, these bodies decay and they get old and they die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So he's saying just like we all, all, the, we all die through Adam, we are all made alive when we're born again through Christ because the seed that Christ... Well, I'll get to that in just a second here. Look at verse 23. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now... This is referencing here, especially verses 23 and 24. It's talking about Christ being the first fruits. In verse 20, it says, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. This is talking about the resurrection of Christ, that Christ is the first fruits. 
after the first fruits, which is Christ, there's going to be another resurrection. And it says, afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Those that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ comes back again, the rapture is going to happen, and that is when you will see what's called the first resurrection. See, Christ is the first fruits. Then the rapture is the first resurrection, which those that are asleep in Christ, those that have died before us, that were believers, that were saved, are going to rise from the dead. And those of us which are alive and remain, we're not going to prevent those that are asleep, those that have already passed away, that when Christ comes back, we're all going to be raptured up. And that there are people that were dead, their bodies are going to be resurrected from the dead. Their bodies are going to come back up. And in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they're going to be changed. We're going to get new glorified bodies, which is we're going to read in a minute here. But Christ is the first fruits. Then there's that first resurrection, them that is coming. And then cometh the end. So at the end of everything, there is going to be another final resurrection. And this happens at the, the great white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. So in Revelation chapter 20, we read about uh, Christ and his, you know, God delivers unto Jesus the, you know, all power and authority and he rules and reigns on his earth for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, the devil is loosed from hell for a short season and he goes and deceives all the, the rest of the unsaved earth that is still on the, on the earth at that time that when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning, and um, they all come together for one final battle against Christ and he just destroys them all. And at the end of that thousand years and at the end of that battle, the, the, the death and hell are going to deliver up the dead that is in them and the sea and the earth are going to deliver up the dead that are in them and every man is going to be judged according to their works which, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So those people who are not saved, there's that resurrection of the dead. And they're going to come back and be judged. Because you see, right now, when an unsaved person dies, they go straight to hell. They don't face God and are judged. They go straight to hell. That's why in Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man died and in hell lifted up his eyes. He's like, he died and all of a sudden, boom, he's like, wow, I'm in hell. That's the way it is right now. Judgment Day will happen at the great white throne judgment, which is after the millennial reign of Christ. After the rapture, after God's wrath is poured out, after Jesus Christ's throne is established and he reigns for a thousand years, then comes the end. And then there's that final resurrection. So the Bible says here, there's Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ is coming. Then cometh the end. There are no extra raptures. There's no, you know, it's a lot of people who try to, who, who don't understand, you know, prophecy, don't understand what's going to happen. They try to make things fit and say there's multiple resurrections, there's multiple raptures, and, you know, all these different things at different times. No, there's Christ the first fruits, there's the rapture, and then there's the end. Those are the three resurrections. And that's it. Let's keep reading here, verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And what that means is just basically that Christ is going to reign until all the enemies are under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's why in Revelation chapter 20 we see, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That is when death is destroyed, when death is cast into the lake of fire. That is at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. That is when finally all of his enemies are put under his feet and that they have all been, been subdued under Jesus Christ, and he says when that happens, and, and, and the Bible explains, well, when it says that all things are put under Christ, basically he's saying God is accepted. God the Father is accepted from that. He's, he's an exception that he's not put under Jesus Christ, which did put all things under him. And it says that, um, 
then at the end of that, Jesus gives the kingdom back up to the Father, and God the Father reigns after that millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth, and God the Father rules and reigns then into eternity. Verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And that explains exactly what I just said, that when everything's done, then Jesus Christ, the Son, will be subject unto the authority of God the Father, who, put, who was the one who put all things under Christ to begin with. Verse 29, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, this entire chapter we see is talking about the resurrection, right? And people who aren't believing in the resurrection and everything else. That's everything we've seen up to this point. I don't think when he asks this question that it's just some weird random question out of context that this is talking about some bizarre Mormon ceremony where they baptize people for the dead. I don't think that's talking about this at all. What this is talking about is, as believers, what does baptism symbolize? Baptism symbolizes the gospel. It symbolizes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And what he's saying here is that, you know, what shall I do which are baptized for the dead? We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why would we be baptized for Jesus Christ if he's dead, if the dead rise not up again? Right? I mean, it, it only makes sense. Why would we be baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why would we even show that picture of someone going under the water and coming back up again? I mean, the proper symbol, if there is no resurrection from the dead, is that we'd be putting people underwater and they'd be drowning because they're not coming back up again. Right? That would be the, the symbol if people don't rise from the dead. Why are they then baptized for the dead? And he's just throwing out one more thing. Like, you know, this is what baptism's about. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we do this. You know, because he's teaching the people that, that are in the church of Corinth, which I assume they were probably baptizing people. He said, even through the baptism, like, what are you thinking? Of course it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection that's needed for salvation and that there is a resurrection from the dead. Because that's what he's combating throughout this whole chapter is that belief that there is no resurrection from the dead. It's the, it's the belief that the Sadducees had. Remember, there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they were always fighting with each other and that was the main point of contention between the two was that the Sadducees said that there was no resurrection and the Pharisees believed that there were. So what probably happened here in the church of Corinth is that there was probably the influence of the Sadducees that crept in and saying, well, there is no resurrection and trying to prove that there is no resurrection from the dead into a Christian church where what was taught unto them was the resurrection of the dead. Verse number 30. Man, I need to hurry up. This, this, this chapter is so long. There's so much doctrine in here. Wow. Verse 30. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And I pretty much covered that point already, saying that there's no point. There's no point to the Christian life if this is all we have. Let's eat and drink. Said, why, why did I go and fight beasts at Ephesus? Right? Why did I what, risk my life? Why am I doing all these crazy things if there's not even a resurrection from the dead? Because he's, he's working to earn rewards at the resurrection, at the judgment seat of Christ. That is what he is striving for, that he can win those crowns. Verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Think about that. Think about people that you know, that know you, that don't have the knowledge of God. The people that don't have the knowledge of God around the church of Corinth, they said, I speak that to your shame. Shame on you. You ought to be preaching the gospel to them. That is your job. That's what you ought to be doing. And it's shame unto us when we don't preach the gospel. Verse 35, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, 
That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So now he's explaining the nature of the resurrection and the body that will be when we are raised from the dead because it truly is our body that is resurrected from the grave at the resurrection just as Jesus Christ's was that's why his tomb was empty because his body rose again from the dead it wasn't you know incinerated like the Jehovah's Witnesses might want to teach you his body rose but his body also changed but it was still his resurrected body, right? And it'll still be our bodies that we are resurrected with. But it says here that um, to every seed, his own body. Now, there is a seed of man. And that's what we already read about Adam, right? As, because as by one man, death reigned upon all, right? By, by Adam, um, we have this physical body. The seed that we, that we come from is a seed of copulation, that is where our physical body comes from, that, and, and that's how we receive our physical body we inhabit right now. But the seed that takes root when we are saved is the Word of God. And that seed is what provides us the spiritual body. And, and it's to, that's why the Bible says, to every seed his own body. So we, the, the body comes from that spiritual seed that was sown. And that's why we receive a spiritual body. Verse 39, we'll continue explaining this. All flesh is not the same flesh. Remember Jesus Christ, I'm flesh and bone. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another, fish, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun. And that word glory, just so you know, it's a glory just basically means shining, like brightness. And it's used metaphorically as well as physically. So it's going back and forth between, you know, the glory of a body, how glorious, magnificent it is. And it equates that here, how there is one glory of the sun, right? The sun is real bright. And another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory, in their brightness. Right? They're all different. The light that you get from the stars versus the light you get from the moon versus the light you get from the sun, they're all different. They, they vary in glory. And he's, all, he's, he's equating that to there's different bodies. Right? There's the bodies of, of the birds, there's bodies of the animals, there's bodies of, of humans, you know, there's, um, you know, whatever, all these celestial and terrestrial, earthly and heavenly bodies. And they all have their own glory. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So our physical body, our natural body gets sown in the earth. And this is one of the reasons why we believe in this church in burying our dead. I don't believe in cremation. I don't believe in any other, you know, form of, of dealing with a deceased body than burying our dead because it shows another picture of the resurrection of Christ. We are sowing this body into the earth. We are planting it. You know, we're digging up the earth, planting this seed of a, of a shell of a body, this natural man in the earth. It is raised up a spiritual body. Just saying, hey, this, this natural man is going to be sown into the earth. It's dead, but it's going to, you know, life is going to come back with the resurrection and be, it's going to be transformed into a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We are going to be conformed unto the image of, the, of Jesus Christ with our spiritual body. 
Just as we are now in the image and likeness of Adam physically, because he was a you know, physical man and, and through physical seed we receive these bodies, we physically look like Adam, our spiritual body will, will be emulating Jesus Christ. The image of the heavenly. The Bible says in Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are predestinated, when you're saved, you're predestinated to be conformed to the image of, of Jesus Christ. And that, that lines up perfectly here with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 49. Now look at verse number 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And you might look at that and say, well, wait a minute. Jesus Christ came physically and you know, his disciples handled him. So how is it that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? Well, the key is this. We already read when Jesus Christ said in Luke 24, Behold my hands and my feet, that is, I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Jesus Christ's body was flesh and bones. He did not say flesh and blood. Jesus Christ shed his blood for us on the cross. The, the blood, the Bible says that the blood is the life thereof, which is why we're not allowed, you know, in the Old Testament, they're not allowed to drink blood because that's the life. And Jesus' blood is what gives us life. His blood was shed. He is flesh and bone in his spiritual body. The natural body, what we have running through our body right now is blood. Right? Our body consists of flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, our natural body cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We are not going to heaven in this, in this physical, fleshly, flesh and blood body. This body is going to be transform it's going to be changed into a spiritual body which is flesh and bone flesh and blood's not going to inherit the kingdom of god neither doth corruption inherit incorruption but this corruptible body is going to be changed into an incorruptible body through the seed that was sown in our hearts through the lord jesus christ and that salvation that will give us that new body that we have there's a big difference there, so don't get confused by it. That you know, Jesus Christ was flesh and bone, but not flesh and blood. And you think about, you know, right now the blood gives us our life. We don't need the blood, the physical blood, to keep our bodies alive when we receive our new bodies. Jesus Christ provides the life and the sustenance for our bodies. We won't need the blood at all. It's unnecessary for our, for our spiritual bodies. Verse 51, we're going to finish up here. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And this is that change or that transformation of our physical bodies. He's saying not everybody is going to die. Because it's true. When Jesus Christ comes back, there are going to be believers that are still alive on this earth. We're not all going to sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Twinkling of an eye is like no time, right? I mean, just to see one little catch of, of light shining off of someone's eye, the twinkling of an eye. He said, that quickly, that fast is how fast your body is. It's not going to be this slow process of, oh man, you're going to feel your body like, you know, it's going to be boom, done. Brand new body. If we're alive and remain, like I think we may be, if we're alive under the, and remain under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's just going to be a like, look up and it's going to be like instant, just new body. Praise the Lord. Amen. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The resurrection is what gives us that hope. The resurrection, this whole resurrection chapter. And when people are saying there is no resurrection, look, the resurrection was that gives us that hope. This is why we need to remain steadfast, on track, unmovable. Don't let anybody distract you from the cause that you have set before you. Don't let the trials and tribulations get you out of the fight because there is a resurrection. And you know that the work that you're doing here, the labor that you're doing is not in vain. It's not for nothing. Christ rose again from the dead. Who believes that here? Amen. I believe that Christ raised from the dead just as much. I believe that. I believe that we will have a resurrection and that we will receive for the things done in our bodies on this earth, which is why we need to keep that focused, stay unmovable, stay steadfast, and keep working and laboring. No matter how weary and tired you become, keep your eyes ahead to that resurrection. It will happen. It's a promise from God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the promise of the resurrection, dear Lord. What a day. I'm looking forward to that day, dear Lord, when this incorruptible shall put, or shall, um, this corruptible shall put on incorruption, dear Lord, and when you save our mortal bodies and give us immortal bodies, dear Lord, and, and, and change us into uh, this, uh, an image that's going to be more conformed to the image of your Son, dear Lord. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the free gift of salvation, dear Lord. Help us to go out and labor and do the work of preaching the gospel, of preaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection, dear Lord, and preaching the hope that people can have through Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen.